The laws of physics are quite clear. Free will does not exist. And I agree with them. Don't get me wrong, I'm not happy about this fact. I really want to believe that free will has a space to exist, but I cannot find any location for it to live in, in any of the evidence or understanding that we have about our universe. And that is a strange idea to come across because it definitely feels like you're in control, that you know how and why you decide something. Unfortunately, science tells us that that couldn't be further from the truth. Today, I just want to do an exploration of this space because it is absolutely fascinating. A question that you think can only be answered by poets, philosophers, artists can actually only be talked to by the laws of the universe themselves. I want to walk us from the most fundamental laws that we know of through the emergent properties that manifest from these basic components to what we've seen in some of our most recent experiments performed on the human brain. And I think you will come to the same conclusion as me, that free will doesn't exist and that's okay. Let's start at the very most fundamental laws of the universe. And you might think here I'm about to introduce particle physics or quantum mechanics, but actually I think there is a deeper fabric to examine first on which the laws of the universe play out. This is the nature of causation. Things don't happen unless something makes them happen. That sounds like a very hand wavy idea, but it isn't. In fact, we can measure the speed of cause and effect. It moves at 299,792,458 meters per second. This is also the speed of light and also the speed of gravity. It isn't light or gravity that set this speed limit on the universe, it's causation. Hence, two totally unrelated phenomena move at this same universal speed limit. If we extend this idea, these causes cause effects, which must in turn then be the causes of other effects on and on further down the line. So there is a causal link of connectivity stretching all the way through time from the Big Bang to you here now watching this video. If we could measure all of the pieces in that assembly, if we knew all of the forces and all of the positions and all of the velocities of all those particles at one time, we could predict the future and retrodict the past with absolute certainty. That's ridiculous. Only horoscopes can predict the future. This idea is called determinism that cause perfectly maps to effect. All of classical physics has this as an underlying assumption. It is encoded into Newton's first law. An object will remain at rest or in motion unless acted upon by an outside force, causation. That sounds perfectly reasonable, but to be complete about the base layer of the universe, just in case, let's examine the opposite. That cause has no link to effect. That even with full knowledge of all the circumstances, it would not be possible to predict the outcome with certainty. That there is inherent unpredictability or randomness to at least some aspects of the universe. Now this idea was famously unpopular with Einstein. He said, God does not play dice. But to be complete, just to leave no gap, just let's assume that this is possible in the cosmos. It is on these elements that a strange corner of the universe is built, quantum mechanics. Quantum theory suggests that at the atomic and subatomic levels, particles do not have definite states, that uncertainty is inherent into this particle's properties. They exist instead in superpositions, which means sums of possible states, until they are observed, which means measured. Take for instance, they collide with some other particle out there, and then and only at that point, they fall into one of those many possible states. We call that collapsing the wave function. We know that radioactive elements can decay, giving off a particle or a photon, but no measurement we can make on that radioactive element can tell us exactly when they will decay. We just know that they will follow this curve of probabilities. We can describe this as the wave function of the radioactive atom. It is a sum of all the possible times it could decay, with a strength weighting for the likelihood of that decay happening during a particular time window. If there is a cause of this decay, it is totally hidden from our ability to detect it. So it is either random, or at least for all intents and purposes, appears and can be treated as being random. These are the fundamental layers of the universe, determinism and classical physics built on top of it, or indeterminism and the unpredictable world of quantum mechanics. At these levels of the universe, either cause creates effect or things happen randomly, or maybe a bit of both. But regardless, it's one course to the next, to the next, all the way down the line, then maybe occasionally something random happens, but then its effect follows that normal cause and effect pattern. Already from here, I don't see where free will fits. If we know the input conditions and the outputs are direct functions of those input conditions, there is no space for freedom or choice. Everything is absolute. 
But just for the sake of argument, can we try to crowbar free will into the randomness of the universe as many people have tried? I'm personally not so sure. Take the example of an atom decaying. It's random, but its choices are definitely constrained. So number one, how free is it really? Number two, where would the machinery of this randomness sit? If these are fundamental building blocks of the universe, where do we encode further information? If there is something controlling these behaviors, say, it seems to reliably follow a pattern. So although an individual result maybe occurs anywhere, taken as an aggregate, the distribution will 100% of the time look like this, implying if there is hidden machinery, it reliably produces the same answers time and time again, so where does free will sit? At the bottom, at this lowest level, free will, I think, doesn't find much purchase. But on these laws of the universe, a huge amount of complexity, including life itself, is built. And life, we know, isn't hard-coded into these rules of things like electromagnetic attraction, and yet, here we are. So is free will possible as a higher order emergent phenomena? I want to talk about that, but before we get there, it's already been determined that I have to thank today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the best website builder I have ever used. I've built about 40 Squarespace websites in the past few years. Setup is a breeze. It takes just minutes to get started using the pre-existing templates provided by Squarespace, and then using your sense of free will to bespoke them to your need. Whether it's a personal brand, team, or company site, the ease and intuitiveness of maintaining managing and refining that website is why I've stayed with Squarespace for so many years. The variety of built-in elements available to you or your ability to build your own allows you to evolve the site easily to suit your needs. This is a product that I think 100% delivers on what you actually need from it, which is a rare thing nowadays. So if you are interested, head to www.squarespace.com forward slash Dr. Ben Miles to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain name using the code Dr. Ben Miles. Squarespace, thank you for existing. Okay, now back to the video. Maybe free will isn't written at the base code of the universe. Maybe it's emergent, like smell or color or taste. A collection of gold atoms individually aren't gold color. The color only emerges as you bring these atoms together to form a metal and the electrons start to move collectively. Most metals reflect all colors equally, that's why they look silverish. Gold is unusual because it absorbs some red, making it look gold complicated. Last week, we looked at assembly theory. Check out the video here or down in the description, whose authors Lee Cronin and Sarah Walker suggest that in a universe that should otherwise look just like simple molecules rather than the machinery of life that we see, that this emerges because chemistry naturally creates structures that are good at preserving and building in complexity. They argue complexity is an emergent property of the universe built out of electronic bonds when those structures randomly develop to form structures that can repeat certain behaviors, like making copies of themselves. So, can something similar be derived for free will? Let's look at some of the options and arguments and counterarguments. The first one, and I think this is the quickest to run through, I call the fine cutting argument. And that is simply that free will cannot exist at the level of the organism because ultimately the organism is made up of atoms that behave deterministically, maybe sometimes indeterministically. But regardless, if the atoms behave this way, the molecules that they make must also, and the more complex molecules, these molecules then produce, and so on and so on, all the way up into the level of the organism. There is no gap for free will to inject itself because each step is assuming that the rules of the universe are being followed. But why can life emerge but free will can't? The definition of life is the ability to reliably form increasing complexity. That reliability requires determinism. If it wasn't reliable or reproducible, if atoms or molecules could choose their behavior, we wouldn't have the system stability to do all the functions that life needs. Life requires incredibly high levels of repeatable determinism. Which takes us to a weird idea. Because life can exist in our universe, it means that free will can't. Free will needs there to be a gap in the cold, reliable determinism, and life forbids this. I think that's reasonable. It's hard to argue against, and I think any argument beyond this ultimately gets trumped by this one. 
But hey, we are desperate here, so let's indulge in some of the other approaches that I've heard about. I hear people saying that maybe this is something that just happens in the electronic circuitry of the brain. It's not all matter, it's not atoms and molecules, it's not our arms and legs, they don't have free will, it is just our brains. Maybe the web of electronic signals gives rise to some emergent phenomena that we don't see anywhere else in the universe on top of that sea of firing neurons. That's kind of an interesting idea. There are some concepts here that are worth talking about that actually mirror our discussion of quantum mechanics. When a particle is in a superposition and it collapses in a particular configuration, we said this is called a wave function collapse, some physicists that like the idea of many parallel universes or just generally causing trouble like to imagine that at that point of collapse, a universe where the particle was say spin up split from a universe where the particle was found to be spin down. Just maybe that extends to the idea that when I choose to go to the gym or not go to the gym, suddenly a universe is spawned into existence where I'd picked the opposite. That obviously is a trick question because I didn't choose to go to the gym in either, but also that would mean universes were popping into existence constantly. If you have to spawn into existence an entire reality just to preserve your workout self-conceit, that seems like a lot to ask of a universe. And frankly, I don't buy it for the particle or for the choice. And even if it was happening, how does that relate to our concept of free will? We're still locked into one of these pathways with no ability to jump between universes at will. Let's move up from this weird world of quantum to the world of neurons in the brain. We get sight here of another quantum-like behavior, superposition again, though this time classical, or at least probably classical. The structure of the brain is basically an analog computer, albeit a very complicated one. The neurons within the brain are connected to other neighboring neurons, the stimulus enters the system, and after running for some time, the system completes its calculation. Have you ever felt like two options are on the table in front of you? Simulating one in your head might evoke uncertainty, but maybe excitement, maybe the other one, safety, but potential boredom. We have a superposition of different options moving forward, maybe with different amplitudes of their likeliness depending on personality, which is really just how the circuitry of the individual has been wired through past experience, both external and internal reflection. The only way to collapse the wave function is to run the simulation and take the measurement. Strange question, but have you ever felt happy, sad? That is perfectly reasonable. Researchers have shown that positive and negative emotions can coexist in the brain independently of each other. The right hemisphere processes negative emotions preferentially, whereas positive emotions are dealt with by the left side of the brain. Extending this process and simplifying it a lot, if we then were to try and assume that free will existed, where would we put this process? Where would we put this decision engine relative to that mechanism happening in the brain? Maybe we do have a small area of the brain that is necessary to run this sort of calculation, but in this area, it would need that same sort of circuitry to control itself. If it runs anywhere in the circuitry of the brain, it must be deterministic if it is to be machine-like at all, else it needs to sit outside of the brain, having some level of magical influence that allows it to look down at the brain and turn the dials just how it sees fit. And again, I think that is a lot to ask of a universe just to pretend that you may one day get back on that diet. That might make you feel like this is an uncomfortable idea that you are a biological machine acting out the inevitable series of actions, but you don't know what these actions are and can't know without running the simulation. So the point is finding out. A few people I've talked to have come back to me and said, well, it certainly feels like I'm making decisions and enacting my free will. And my question back to you is, what if there was a way that we could tell? In a study published in 2018 in Nature Neuroscience, researchers using brain scanners were able to predict people's decisions seven seconds before the test subjects were even aware of making the decision. The experiment asked users whether to hit a button with your left hand or your right hand, and recorded the signals that the brain made as it processed this decision. Not a complicated choice, but surely one that we have full control over. Unfortunately, by observing micro patterns of brain activity, the researchers were able to predict the subject's scores before they indicated knowing the choices themselves. It turns out that your decisions are very strongly prepared by the circuitry of your brain. By the time you are conscious of making a decision, that decision has already been made for quite some time. 
But because this study was very simple, in a follow-up study, the research team moved to a more complex and considered set of choices. Participants were presented with a series of numbers on a screen and asked to either add or subtract two of those numbers. Using fMRI brain imaging, researchers were able to predict the subject's choices based on brain activity up to four seconds before the research participants were consciously aware of their choices. So if we are trying to suggest that free will lives maybe in our consciousness or our self-awareness and it has ultimate veto rights over the choices that we are making one way or the other, it would appear that actually this is totally the wrong way around. Consciousness, your internal self monologue or however you want to define it, actually just seems to be an engine of self-explanation, of self-reasoning, not thought or choice. As insane of a paradigm shift as that is, your consciousness, which most people define as them themselves, has little to no control over anything you do. And there's proof. A field of experimentation called split brain research pioneered by Michael Gazinga took patients where the two halves of their brain, the left brain and the right brain, can no longer communicate, either because of some past trauma or because they have been medically separated, which used to be done to reduce seizures in patients. And it showed us shockingly how unin control of our brain we actually are. Because the left eye connects to the right brain and the right eye to the left brain, in subjects where the corpus callosum, the connective tissue between the right and the left brain, has been severed, when subjects are shown a stimulus to just one eye, the other side of the brain is unaware of this stimulus. If an object is shown to the right eye, the left brain sees it and the left brain also contains the language part of the brain and can say what the right eye has seen. But if the left eye is shown something, so the right brain sees it, the patient can't describe the object at all. And interestingly, they don't say, I can't see it, they say, I wasn't shown anything. But then when asked, they can point to which object they were shown in a lineup of possible objects, but they can only do this with the left hand because that's the one the right brain controls. Now that's interesting in and of itself, but it goes one step further. When the right brain is given a command like stand up or smile and it obeys it, if you then ask the patient why they obeyed it, they don't say, I'm not sure, I just felt like it. They say, oh, I uh, needed to walk around and stretch my legs, or, oh, I remembered something funny that happened to me. The section on the left side of the brain responsible for this creative reasoning is called the interpreter. And although consciousness, I suppose, is the sum of all neural activity that you are aware of in your brain, and yes, these patients have had half of that very important information cut off from them, if the part of your brain that is still able to vocalize the why of your decisions is obviously so completely unaware of what is actually happening that it needs to make something up, then really how aware or in control of our decisions can we really be? And this kind of has an interesting implication. Free will just cannot exist, but equally it never has. Our futures may have already been written or randomized, take your pick, but I don't think that means that they aren't without purpose. Decisions still very much exist, even if they are played out by the internal hardwired circuitry of the brain. Consciousness or our ability to evaluate the journey as we experience it, though subject to bias, maybe subconsciously already pre-prepared in its opinions, is still experience. Joy is still joy and sorrow is still sorrow. We are part of a great connected universe where the play button was hit billions of years ago and the story is continuing to unfold with us both as the actors and the audience. What you do with that information is your choice. Hey guys, well done making it to the end of the video, whether it was through your own free will or whether it was predetermined, regardless, good job. If you liked this one, leave us a thumbs up. If you're new here, subscribe to see more of this sort of content. Thanks again very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.